John Bush live free, um, John Bush channel there. I don't see it on my end. Looks like we should be good though. Okay, excellent, excellent, excellent. All right, folks. Uh, again, the Excellent Build Land Summit is taking place May 18th through the 22nd. May 18th through the 22nd. We hope you'll join us. You can watch for free online or you can get a virtual immersion pass to be more in-depth. Watch all three days of the conference. Or better yet, you show up in person. It's a five-day event. We're doing farm tours. There's the stream. We're doing farm tours on uh, that day one. And then on day five, there's also farm tours, farm to table meals, a lot of incredible speakers that you'll be able to meet in person. You get a VIP pass, you'll be able to join us for a really special dinner. Uh, if you want to check out Michael's website, earthship.com, earthship.com, they got all sorts of stuff going on teaching people how to build earthships and, and beyond. Really just a lot of acts of service to help make this a more sustainable planet and to help people to get off the grid. So without further ado, let's bring on uh, our guest for today, Mr. Michael Reynolds. How are you today? Howdy. Good. Good to be here. Excellent. Excellent. So maybe you could just start by introducing yourself to the audience, and I'd be curious to know what it is you were doing before you invented or innovated this whole Earthship thing. Uh, well, my name is Michael Reynolds, and I work out of Taos, New Mexico. And I've been I've been doing it for 55 years, just straight out of architectural school, uh, landed in Taos, New Mexico. And uh, the whole thing we're doing, the Earthship concept is really, it is me responding to the world around me. And when I, when I see mountains of tires that we don't know what to do with, and I see them burning, and I see us cutting down all of our trees to make housing, I end up putting two and two together and say, well, we don't want the tires, let's use them. And we want the trees, let's don't use them. But then after you do that for a while, you find out that there's really no better building material on the planet than tires, if you understand them and use them right. And so it, one thing leads to another. And then the they, they start talking about water shortages and inner shortages. I just keep incorporating that, responding to that and incorporating it into these vessels that we build called Earthships. And we end up with uh, a, a producing a product that um, really makes housing more uh, possible for people that is absolutely autonomous and sustainable. Excellent. Absolutely love it. Uh, let me ask you this. What encouraged you to get into architecture? Is that something you're fascinated with as a youngster? Well, what's that all about? Well, um, it, yeah, I had my childhood. My my father, was he built houses uh, for us. He didn't build houses to sell. And he was a carpenter and he he and I dug a, a full basement under a, a shotgun house uh, by hand, <laughs> shoring it up as we go. So I learned how to work and I learned about building. And then I was pretty good at drafting and drawing in, in high school and sort of architecture just presented itself. And there I was. And I, I went to University of Cincinnati for architecture. And then uh, strangely enough, uh, over the six year course, it was six years to complete the course. Um, I got placed in architectural firms throughout the world and country and, uh, you know, to work on the off school sections. And um, I pretty much learned that I didn't want to do architecture in the conventional sense because architecture in the conventional sense was either building big boxes like Walmart or whatever, or Arby's or whatever, or if you're one of the lucky ones doing fancy super expensive pieces of sculpture that 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 aren't that don't work you know they work for housing whatever gallery or whatever they were supposed to do but uh be for but they they for they cost fifty thousand dollars a month just to operate and so i wasn't into that and i wasn't into the big boxes so i kind of got uh accidentally threw myself into my own definition of architecture which turned out not to go over too well with the architectural community. So I had to invent a profession called biotexture and that's what we do. 
I have a feeling just like with medical schools, not teaching so much about nutrition and the importance of diet, uh, the architecture schools probably don't get too much into natural building. Is that the case? No, they don't. Um, I, I, and I agree with you on the medical schools do not even, they barely touch nutrition. Medical schools teach you how to, um, what drugs to use for what symptoms and architecture is the same. It teaches you what drugs to use for what symptoms. Uh, it doesn't, it doesn't bring people and planet together. And I tried to do that via the profession of architecture and I got slapped down and stung so bad that I just said, hold it. I'm, I'm not going to be a part of this. I'm going to invent a new profession that really honestly addresses what we're dealing with on this planet. And it, it little by little evolved into at this point, we are, we have dis labeled six points of sustenance and survival on this planet. And they are comfortable shelter that does not use fossil fuel, water, electricity, treatment on site of sewage, producing your own food and addressing your garbage issue. And garbage issue is a huge one because, you know, you, you, you make the New York City garbage companies on strike for two or three days and you've got mountains of garbage on both sides of the street. So these six things that we labeled, it is my opinion that every building built on this planet must address these six things that we've labeled by encountering the natural phenomena of the planet rather than being vulnerable and dependent on a power uh, utility grid. Right on. So I imagine before coming to what we all know as, as an Earthship home, uh, what were some of the things that you had to overcome? Were there some initial prototypes? And actually, before you answer that question, can you just describe in your own words, what is an Earthship home? We've already kind of touched on some of the bits and pieces of it, but what's the elevator pitch for what, what an Earthship is? An Earthship is a, is a building, but usually it's a home, that encounters the natural mm -hmm. phenomena of the planet to provide sustenance for people. It's a vessel. We don't even use the word house. It's a vessel that encounters the natural phenomena of the planet uh, to address the six issues of survival of humans on the earth in a earth friendly way. Okay, excellent. And what are some of the trials and tribulations perhaps you went through in, in coming up with this model that, that we know as the Earthship? Well, fortunately it happened over 50 years, 55 mm -hmm. years actually at this point. And so it wasn't, you know, uh, a, a war all at once is many, many battles. And, and, you know, the, the first part of it was fun. Learning to do this was physics and biology. And it was fun. You know, we failed a lot of times and just kept failing a little less and failing a little less. And so where, you know, a couple of decades ago, we had something that really worked. And recently it's gotten to work so well that we're ready to really get it out there in a, in an automobile industry type way, like Henry Ford got the Model T's out there, an assembly line of, of structure and an and a easy way to get them in the hands of people. Yes, we have a school, an academy, that teaches people how to do this, but we've also got to get it out there for those many, many that are just not capable of building their own home, no matter how easy we make it. They are different, you know, they, what if you had to build your own car? I mean, it's, it, even if it was a sustainable autonomous car, or whatever, it's not easy for a lot of people to do that kind of thing, but yet it's very easy for people to walk into a, a car dealership and plunk down 600 bucks and walk out with the keys to a BMW. So that's, that's what we're trying to do at this point is make it very easy. But to answer your question about how, you know, the problems along the way, uh, there's just every one you can think of. The learning to do the physics and the biology was, was the first and fun part. But then you have to, I, I've, I am still and have in the past had to convince people that they need this. 
and much less now that uh, you know the earth is crumbling and all the waters are polluted and and uh, we're we're witnessing uh, climate change as we speak and so on. Uh, people are starting to recognize, yes, we need it. But in the past decades ago, I was having to convince people that we're going to need this. And now we need it. Now we need it. I don't have to convince people, but even still, after they learn that we need it, that they need it, they need to let go of what we already have. It's called dogma. You know, uh, it basically needs to be melted away at this point because it keeps us from evolving. And that's what the Earthship does is simply blast through dogma. Excellent. Somebody in the comments said, uh, Earth dealerships. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was pretty clever. So, you know, I, I appreciate that you brought up failing because uh, one of the things we do at Live Free Academy is help teach people success principles and philosophy and really push people to overcome their limiting beliefs, right? So can yeah. you talk about how important persistence is and how you know failure is just one step on the road to success often people give up once they fail but at the end of the day you never truly fail unless you give up can you touch on that because i know you have been through a lot 50 years in the making why what's the importance of failure in, in learning and, and keeping going well failure is it just simply education um and that's the that's the thing that we we've had to accept is is uh, in our world it's very fixed and very um, professional so to speak which needs to be in quotes but you can't fail or you get sued you can't fail or or, or uh, you know people get want to discredit you uh, failure is we're taught that failure is a bad thing but to me failure is the way of learning and I didn't have anybody to teach me the things that we do, I had to trial and error, trial and error to get them. And now I, I see that that's the way to keep going. Don't be afraid of failure. Um, each time you fail, you get a little closer to something that works. And in 55 years, you can believe that I have had numerous failures. Um, so uh, that's what we're looking at is using failure, the rungs of failure as a ladder to to success, but the ladder never runs out. You you never really get all the way there. Uh, you're you're because it's it has to keep evolving. Excellent. Why New Mexico? Uh, is was that, is that where you're from? What's the story with New Mexico? Because I know that's where you guys. Well, are based. here's the reason for New Mexico. Uh, is I was just graduating from college, and. Uh, uh, the Vietnam War was going to take me. And uh, I was also uh, had gotten into motocross racing. So I came out to New Mexico to race motocross to get injured so I wouldn't have to go to Vietnam. That was the uh, that was the. The rationale for me even getting here. Well, that's a pretty clever move there. <laughs> yeah. Excellent, excellent. OK, cool. So. Let me ask you again, uh, the tires, right? So you said that tires were one of the tools you wanted to use in the Earthships because there was just a plentiful amount of tires. There was a lot of waste. Can you tell yeah. a little bit more about the benefit of using tires? And then we do have one question from the audience, one of our Live Free Academy clients. Catherine asks, have you encountered any issues with the tires off-gassing, or is it possible to build an Earthship without them? Um. Well, it's for one, it's possible to build an airship without them for sure. Um, but um, the the anything massive can build an airship. Um, ty uh, tires filled with earth, stone, uh, concrete. You know, we've done it all. Adobe, rammed earth. You can do a, a airship with all these materials, but it just turns out that tires are indigenous to the entire planet. I've never been anywhere where they don't have tires and they're indestructible. They're, the Australians call them uh, radially reinforced rammed earth bricks. Uh, yes, it's unusual still for people to build out of a piece of garbage. Well, it's not a piece of garbage. It's a damn well-built thing. Uh, and so um, it's, that's, that's the 
nature of tires as we speak. Uh, they are a natural resource. Right on. So can we talk more about the off-grid nature of Earthships? I understand uh, y'all incorporate solar panels and then there's a way to do the water collection. And I'd love to hear more about the trash aspect. Well, the, the, uh, we're again, those are, those are part of the six points. You must deal with garbage. And a lot of the things we do were, were garbage, um, influenced us, you know, humans invented garbage. We, the garbage is not prevalent or even doesn't exist in nature. Humans invented garbage. So my, the whole thing started with me trying to contrive a way to use garbage to build with from building with a, it started with a beer can house and a, and then used bottles and then used tires. And then we got into energy and it turns out that tires filled with rammed earth become, uh, they, they become a vessel that holds energy. Uh, heat goes to the cooler place and it's stored in uh, a massive in dense mass. So we, we just, over the 55 years, we got into, well, uh, if we orient these massive buildings toward the sun, the sun comes in, fills them up with mass, uh, it fills the mass up with uh, heat, and you have um, a building that heats itself. I mean, it's a little more involved than that. A, a good way to, to portray it is like a thermos bottle. Everybody understands a thermos bottle. You know, you put tomato soup, hot tomato soup in a thermos bottle in the morning, and at one o'clock for lunch, it's still hot. So it's, they understand that that's how that works. The soup is mass and it's hot and the insulation in the thermos bottle surrounds it and keeps it hot. So if you once interject heat into an insulated cavity, it's going to stay hot because the heat can't go anywhere. And that's essentially what an earthship is. We introduce the heat with the sun into the mass of the walls. And whereas in the th case of the thermos bottle, the soup is the mass. And then we have a little bubble inside the soup for people to live in. That's kind of, everybody understands a thermos bottle. That's all there is to an earthship, but it makes buildings that stay at 70 degrees Fahrenheit year round, no matter what. With, you, you know, your energy, your power goes down, like in Texas last winter and the, and the Arkansas and all the places where the power grid went down and people were taking their kids out to their BMW and turning on the car so that they could keep their kids warm. You don't have that in an airship. While all that was going on and while people were waiting in line for food and waiting in line for water, even wealthy people, I was walking down my hallway barefoot harvesting tomatoes and bananas and, you know, had plenty of water, plenty of heat. These things take care of you. And for free, it is, you know, it is beyond logic. Okay, and then the thing's powered by solar panels, yeah? So it's heated from the sun due to the orientation with the sun uh, and the earth walls, right? And does the energy come, the energy to you know power your phone, turn the lights on, that comes from solar panels? And why did you choose solar panels? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> the electricity aspect of living. Um, if you do not want to use the grid, which is very unreliable, not only is it unreliable, it's expensive. Not only is it expensive, it is ugly. Not only is it that, the way they get electricity is by damming up rivers and burning and, and uh, creating nuclear power plants. The whole thing about electricity is devastating to this planet. Whereas the sun shines on every house and the sun makes electricity from solar panels. And that's that just makes sense. It, it renders the grid useless. What I, what I find very, very sorry and sad is the people that say we're on a green, we're on the green path here by taking a thousand acre green field and filling it full of blue and aluminum alum, uh, solar panels and then putting that energy into the grid and delivering it to people. Well, that same energy that comes from the sun that shines in the field now full of solar panels also shines on every house. We don't need the grid anymore. The sun comes directly to every house. The rain comes directly to every house. Every house can use uh, gardening to treat its own sewage system. In other words, 
we're we're attached to this thing called the grid and it's a piece of our dogma that keeps us from evolving so in my mind it is not green to take a thousand acre green field and turn it blue and aluminum with solar panels and then put that into a grid we need to jump ship here on the grid and say okay the time for the grid is over like a good, a good example of this is when they invented the airplane, they already had automobiles and, and roads to take you from uh, Miami to Detroit. But then they came up with the airplane. Now, what if they said, well, we've already got this system of highways. We're going to make the airplanes fly over the highways to get from Miami to Detroit. How ridiculous does that sound? Well, it's just as ridiculous now to put solar energy into a grid when the sun shines on every house. OK, what do you say to those that would say that solar panels aren't often created from sustainable means? Well, you have to you're, everybody's going to find something wrong with anything. Uh, so what I'm saying is it's the lesser of all evils. Making solar panels is a less detriment to the planet than a nuclear power plant plus a grid, plus dams, plus the unreliability. The, the grids go down every ice storm, every tornado, every, uh, I would say at least half of every night on the news, I hear 200,000, 3 million people, whatever, are without power due to a tornado, due to a ice storm, due to uh, somebody damaging the transfer stations, whatever. The, the, uh, the grid is vulnerable and it's the panels make you independent. Yes, you can say the aluminum panels, the silicone, everything we do is going to do some damage. You're definitely going through life here looking at the lesser of the evils in terms of you and your present and your future of humanity being able to exist on this planet. Yeah, and there's people that'll nitpick and pick apart every single thing. And so it's kind of like we do the best with what we have at the moment. Are you a fan of electric cars by chance? Well, of course. Um, yeah, then people are going to jump you there about batteries. Yeah. But batteries are getting better and better. And also it puts you into the... See, another thing I like about the solar panels is we're going to evolve beyond solar panels to some other kind of more uh, uh, earth-friendly method even to collect the sun. But the thing is taking the solar panels and the batteries and using them right now lets us know that there are other ways besides nuclear power plants and, and power grids. Power grids are archaic. You look at, when I go to a city, I look up through wires at a dirty sky, you know, power, power grids are archaic. Now automobiles that are electric, that's definitely, better than gasoline by far, but still you're going to find people that say, well, what about the batteries and this and that? Well, they're still better than gasoline engines that cause us to rape the earth looking for oil and so on. So I'm always, I'm always a lesser of the evils person, you know, unless we're just going to stand there naked in the rain, uh, we're going to be doing something bad, you know, but the way we're doing it now, the life that we're having on this planet and what we're doing to this planet, I, you know, it would do us good to stand naked in the rain for a little bit to just observe uh, what we're doing. We don't even think about it because our, our whole our lives are so busy uh, dealing with the the way that we get a life. And that's uh, a very sorry tale. And. We also have to get everything through money. The whole economic system is you can't do anything without money. If in the, in the pharmaceutical industry, in the medical industry, um, if you can't make a billion dollars off of it, then, you know, you can't make a billion dollars off of, dand, off of uh, dandelions. So nobody's going to show that dandelions are really, really good for you. But, but you can't patent a dandelion and sell it because nature's already done it. So they want to patent something that's nearly like a dandelion, but not as good so they can make a fortune off of it. There are so many things about the way we could live on this planet that are like that. There are, there are, I've read it. I've been studying this. There are cures for cancer that are 
out there that are, you know, that, that are very effective treatments of cancer, but they're held up in court because of three or four different pharmaceutical companies fighting over the patents so that they can be the one to make the million dollars, the billion dollars off of it, or million, many billions. So we're looking at things like that, and that's keeping us from evolving when really most everything we need for nutrition and health, we can grow in an Earthship greenhouse. Yeah, I'm totally with you. And you bring up a lot of good points. Um, we have a we have a, a Tesla Model 3. It's our primary vehicle. And we also have a solar system. So we're able to charge our automobile with our house's electric uh, electrical system, which is pretty cool. We are tapped into the grid, however. We already tapped into the grid. Um, and we weren't able to untap from the grid. Uh, I have, you know, I have a company. I sell Kratom. I'm actually drinking some right now. It's a plant remedy. It helps people with stress, anxiety, pain. But because it's a plant and you can't patent it, the government is opposed to it. The big pharmaceutical companies use the government to make it hard to do biz, uh, unfortunately. So let's talk a little bit about decentralization and independence. So these earth ships are completely free of any centralized systems. Is that right? Whether it comes to waste, uh, that's both you know the toilet and also electricity, and then you grow a whole lot of food. I imagine you can't grow an entire family's diet, though, in the greenhouse there. Can you talk about independence and, and decentralization and why that's important? Well, uh, you're going to get a lot of arguments on decentralization because they link it to the economy and so on. But the economy is just as shaky as the grid. And, uh, and you know, people do things just for the economy. I mean, for all we know, and this is a big, serious, sore topic, but Wars are fault just to keep the economy healthy. Well, that means the economy is not something we want to deal with. And so we, we are capable with the Earthship of being absolutely autonomous. That might be a little radical in around the edges for some people. So, okay, uh, be 90% autonomous. Make it so you're not in crisis when the grid goes down. Make it so you're not in crisis when the stores do not have food on the shelves, because that has happened. We've seen it. And so I'm looking at the making a vessel that does that very much like a ship at sea or a ship in space. You're you're autonomous out there and you got to be. Well, that's the ideal is to be autonomous. And um, it it does make it possible for you to not be in crisis when all of these other things happen. And I used to say, well, as far as food goes, you can grow enough to help you auxiliate your, your diet, but you can't grow enough to stay alive in an earthship. Well, then I got diagnosed with stage four cancer a few years back, and I became pretty much a vegan vegetarian. And, um, and you know, I used to say, well, I can't grow a hamburger, a cheeseburger in my greenhouse. I can't grow a steak and a margarita in my greenhouse. So I can just auxiliate with some fruits and vegetables. But now, hell, I can live. I can live from a greenhouse of a two-bedroom home. Yes, you're not going to get fat, but you can really get into what you can grow, and you can you can almost grow anything. You know, like b bananas and tomatoes and berries and and uh, trees and grapes and uh, and you know, it, it, there are many diets out there that that say you don't really need grains. Uh, and so you don't have to worry about the grains. You can grow some grains. But the point is, now that I have gotten into seriously into nutrition and and uh, what you can do for yourself with nutrition and how that treats the body. I mean, Herodotus, I believe, or somebody like that said, uh, you know, food is thy medicine and medicine is thy food. Uh, that's that's the way it is. And an earthship can produce enough to keep you alive. Therefore, with water, power, food, sewage, biology, you can be autonomous, you can be independent. Right on. Um, sorry to hear about that cancer diagnosis. What are some of these remedies that you're exploring that you referenced? Uh, I know there's some folks that have done a lot of work with Laetrile and apricot seeds. And then of course there's Gerson therapy, uh, which seems to be pretty, pretty positive, pretty impactful. C can you share some of the stuff that you've been exploring? Well, I've been exploring now for three, uh, close to four years. And uh, 
you know, I've read every kind of book. There's so many different diets out there and there's, you know, there are so many different people saying so many different things. It just blows your mind. But there are things that everybody agrees on. So I take, you know, I take um, all the things that this person says and all the per things that this person says and only in which are diametrically opposed in a lot of books and everything. So the things that everybody agrees on, that's what I use. For instance, nobody says that spinach is bad for you. <laughs> you know, some people say meat's bad for you. Some will say it's good for you. That then they get into it must be grass fed and grass finished and all of that. But then for they'll say red meat is not good for hearts and heart attacks and things like that. So there are people that say meat's good for you, people that say meat's bad for you. But nobody says spinach is bad for you. Nobody says tomatoes are bad for you. Nobody says exercise is bad for you. So all the things that that nobody puts a negative label on, those are the things that I do. And uh, yeah, they you know you you get into what a tomato has that is good for you. It's lycopene, and uh, you know they the whole laetrile thing, the apricot seeds. Some said it was good for you. Some said it was bad for you. Some said indifferent. Uh, you know, so I do, the things that a lot of people say have something going. That's my second list. My first list are the things that nobody disagrees with. And like I say, nobody disagrees with exercise being good for you. So I get exercise. I work. I make it. So I mix exercise into my life. I So I work. I pound tires. I build buildings. So that's, that's the thing that I have taken away from three and a half to four years of study is that uh, the drug companies are just wanting to treat the symptoms. They don't want to cure cancer. They don't want to cure heart disease. They want people to continue having them so they can continue to make money. It is it is criminal what's going on out there. You know, and the food industry keeps people sick so that the pharmacy industry can get their money to buy their insurance money, if they have it, to buy pharmaceuticals uh, to keep their symptoms treated. But no, neither the pharmaceutical industry nor the food industry wants to keep people healthy in, and, and, you know, they want money. They, you know, chief Joseph said only, I love this. He said only after all the fishes are gone from all the streams and all the trees are gone from all the forest and all the animals are gone from all the planet. Only then will the white man realize that you can't eat money. That's, that's the story right there. Yeah. Pretty solid. Reminds me of the Lorax, uh, that Dr. Seuss book classic. Okay, cool, cool. So, Decentral what, what did you mean by decentralization being uh, controversial? Because at Liberty Academy, we're big fans of decentralization, big fans of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And, you know, one thing I appreciate, I actually like money as a medium of exchange for a functioning economy to have the technology that allows us to present live stream and the camera here and my smartphone. Uh, so I'm totally with you on decentralization, getting <laughs> off grid, becoming as autonomous as possible. And we actually talk about having autonomous economies because the centralized economy is completely controlled, corrupt government in collusion with the big banks and big corporations. So we're trying to get our community to create independence by trading amongst ourselves, especially when it comes to food. But what's your thoughts on decentralization as it relates to the economy? What were you getting at there by saying some people may be turned off by that? Well, decent centralized power means that money is made from selling power. Centralized water means that money is made by, by having a municipal water system. And so it, 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 centralization uh, takes away autonomy, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm looking at it in that way. I'm looking at, see, I have no problem with money like you. I, I don't have a problem with it here. But here's the way to look at money. Money is a tool. Now, let's say you have a crescent wrench. And it turns a hex head boat and you can't turn it with your fingers. You need this tool to turn this boat. You may even need several sizes of crescent wrench to turn several different sizes of boats. So you may need six or eight crescent wrenches, but do you really need a million crescent wrenches? <laughs> so for me, money is the tool that turns the boat that does things, but do I need 
15 billion dollars or 150 billion dollars that's a little bit ridiculous so i use money as a tool and i use the economy i don't i don't the economy is right now very close to what you would call god uh on this planet and i would say i want the economy to be insignificant i yes i agree we need an economy but it needs to be insignificant not the most significant thing in our lives and so you've got it. It's like anything else. There's, look at the sun. The sun is so capable of growing our food in our house and heating our house and making our electricity. But the sun, to be honest with you, it'll say, if you go out in the Sahara Desert for five days naked, I'll kill you. You know what I mean? So you money is killing us because we don't know how to use it. Sun can kill you if you don't know how to use it. There's nothing that's all bad. It's how we encounter it that is bad we don't harness it we don't hoard it we encounter money we encounter the sun we encounter water this is the way to live on this planet this is the way yeah it's, a, it's like uh, using it as a, a servant instead of letting it be your master i caught a lot of flack recently a lot of folks in our audience are kind of, are conspiratorial Myself included, I, I subscribe to the conspiratorial view of history. A small group of people are colluding in secret to really um, interfere with and create some world events, in fact, so they can centralize power. But, you know, I use chat GPT lately for research and for to help with social media posts. And a lot of people are very uh, upset with me about that. But I'm using it as a tool. It's by no means my master or I'm not being controlled by chat GPT or anything like that. So. I think that's the clear distinction, like have a mission in life, leverage these tools to help further your mission. You have any thoughts on that? Well, it's, it is, it's, it's look at everything as a tool and don't abuse it, you know, and, and, and that's, we abuse tools to stash money. We abuse the earth to stash money. We abuse people to stash money. Um, you know, everything is related to money. It's very scary to have the food that you eat grown for money. You know what I mean? Uh, it, that because people are going to cut corners. They want to make a little more money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you don't go on any blanket statement saying economy is bad. Money is bad. Uh, you, you simply, you know, understand these phenomena and how you can use them without devastating the planet and other people. And it, it, it is kind of a hand to mouth thing. Uh, you know, animals all live hand to mouth, you know, squirrels will stash some, some nuts or whatever, but you know, a, a lion doesn't go out and kill 500 antelopes and put them in a warehouse. You know, the, the things that have lasted on this planet for millennia don't do what humans do. Now humans have this intellect that we have, a, a, a that may have been what Adam uh, got a hold of by eating the apple. He shouldn't have done it. <laughs> uh, but the thing is, it, it's a, it's a, it has to do with ego. It has to do with um, us thinking that we're the best thing and the most intelligent thing on this planet. When in fact, I see us as the most, you know, the most unintelligent creature on this planet because we don't know anything about the planet. And uh, we are, if we learn more about it, we learn how to just live and take, breathe. We breathe the planet. We encounter the planet. We don't destroy it and sell it for money because you can't eat money. It kind of goes back to the servant master thing. Human beings have tried to be the master of the planet when we should be its steward or its servant. And, you know, Humility just like you would go a long way in this world. Yeah, I'm with you. And then ego, ego is the great enemy of humility. Um, let me ask you, we were talking, we're talking about health. We're talking about pharmaceutical industry and the food industry, which I appreciate that you got that connection there. The food gets you sick and then they sell you the, the medicine, you stay sick, it only treats the symptoms. In fact, the Rockefeller Foundation really is responsible for modern allopathic medicine and it's chemical and oil-based, petrochemical-based pharmaceuticals is really where it all started. It's also the Rockefellers that created this monocropping phenomenon as well. But anyway, uh, what about unhealthy homes? So my wife used to sell tiny homes and she helped contribute to this tiny home community called Village Farm. Really cool place. And it was actually an agri hood. There was an organic farm that was part of the community. But when these tiny homes, these 399 square foot tiny homes would get delivered, 
fresh from the manufacturer, there were little notices on paper on the inside of the home. And it was basically like, you shouldn't be in this home for a while because of the chemicals we use to treat all of the walls and such, they off gas. Uh, um, can you talk about the unhealthiness of homes? My, my good friends do hemp homes. They're with uh, Haven Earth PMA and they build with hempcrete. And one of the concepts that they put forward is having a healthy home. And I think that's something a lot of doesn't really occur to a lot of people because we're just used to it. Uh, and then once more, I mentioned tires and off gassing. I don't know if that's a controversial thing in, in the Earthship movement. Is it the case that they're, it's not such a threat because they're not getting direct sunlight on them <laughs> and they're like encapsulated? Can you talk about unhealthy well, homes and, and yeah, how that relates? Yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's definitely a, a, a topic. Um, tires, if you go to a brand new tire store, yeah. at the sun shining through the window, you smell rubber. And But the thing is, after tires got 20,000 miles or 10,000 miles on them, they've off-gassed. You know, they're, they've done their primary off-gassing. They off-gas. And then they're covered with mud plaster anywhere from one inch to eight inches. And so they're covered and quit, have, have already aged to the point where they don't off-gas. But there might be some some teeny bit. But the guy that did this, the physicist that did the study for us, he went ahead and took it further and he found the same thing. A manufactured house has signs in it that says, don't bring any elderly or infants in here for six months due to off-gassing. Wow. And you research off-gassing, carpet, all the laminate plywoods and everything, furniture, even clothing, all those things off-gas. We live in a world of off-gassing. Obviously, our whole our car is off-gas, everything, everything off-gasses. So minimum off-gassing is what you want. And yes, it turns out that you can have a healthy home filled with unhealthy furniture. You can have a healthy home filled with unhealthy heat. You can have a healthy home filled with uh, unhealthy clothing that you may wear. So you got to be aware of everything. And it does mean that you want to stay as, you know, call me hippie if you want, but you want to stay as natural as you can with things. And hempcrete is a good thing, except concrete, they say, is bad. So you using hemp for hemp and mud and everything. It is a matter of, you know, you can go too far to the point where you don't have a home. You know, you have a hut, you have a mud hut or something. You have to be aware of all of these things, but it but just like the sun, you use enough of the sun to keep you warm, but not to kill you. You 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 understand that our world is full of off gassing. You're not gonna get it to stop. But but how much can you have in your own home, it goes much further than the home itself. It goes into furniture, computers off gas, everything off gases. So you have to not get freaked out about some things. You have to have a level head about approaching everything. And we we must get a, a more healthy environment to live in. And it involves every aspect of housing, of, of life. Right on. Yeah, holistic approach. If you're just joining us, we are chatting with Michael Reynolds. He is the creator, innovator, uh, biotexture, and also developed this incredible, sustainable, off-grid home uh, model called the Earthship. He's going to be speaking at the X and the Build Land Summit, which is taking place May 18th through the 22nd. You can register or learn more at exitandbuildlandsummit.com, exitandbuildlandsummit.com. We hope that you'll join us and check that out. Lots of incredible speakers bringing together a bunch of people, 400, 450 people in person, thousands watching online. So check that out again at exitandbuildlandsummit.com. Now, Joel Salatin was our keynote speaker at the last land summit, and his talk was all about how to deal with the nosy bureaucrats. When the government's getting in the way of you growing food, doing a chicken farm, or building natural homes, because there's a lot of new concepts, just like with Bitcoin, the regulators and the SEC, they're like, this is a completely new thing. We don't even have rules for this yet. I imagine it's the same with earthships and a lot of natural building techniques. The county governments don't even know what the heck to do with it. Can you share some of your, some of your tales of dealing with the county bureaucrats and how you navigate around that? Yeah, it is. It is definitely a navigation. Uh, I started off, you know, uh, hiding it from them, essentially. Then I got into being an outlaw and getting challenged and almost thrown in jail and losing my license in New Mexico and things like that. 
And then I went to the legislature and I tried to join them and make the legislation uh, as it evolved, be respectful of, of these methods that we were going for. And that was the most uh, horrible experience of my life. I mean, uh, <laughs> to be in the legislature for four years with meetings, I don't see how anything ever gets done from just the, just, just the bureaucratic monster of it down to the payoffs, down to the dogma. It was horrible to be a part of that. And so I, the current thing that I use for all of that is like when a dog, you have a dog and it's got worms and you give a dog, the vet tells you to give the dog worm pills and you have to put it in the dog's mouth and rub its throat and cause it and hold its muzzle shut and cause it to swallow the worm pill. And 90% of the time when, when non-vets do it, uh, they let loose the dog and it just spits the pill out. It hadn't swallowed it. it. tries to bite you when you try to do it. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But you take that worm pill and you roll it up in a ball of hamburger and throw it up in the air. The dog will catch it in midair and swallow it just like that. That's the way I deal with the bureaucrats these days. I wrap everything they want in hamburger. Hmm. And I've got the worm pill inside, but they don't care and don't know. And okay. That, that works. What I don't know if any bureaucrats are watching. You're being kind of cryptic. Can you give us some advice or some some techniques that you use, some tactics? Well, for instance, the sewage system. We put in a conventional sewage system to the utmost best one they've seen. Uh, conventional sewage system. That is the hamburger. The worm pill inside is we have a few valves to to recircuit and direct it in different directions so it produces food and recycles most 90% of the sewage, if not all, and uses it. But we've got in place a conventional system. So we give them the hamburger that they want and we got the worm pill inside. So it, and if they wanted to come and condemn us, we turn these valves, they take the valves out. Mm. We've got your conventional sewage system that takes your toilet material runs it through a septic tank and goes out into a drain field and into your streams and rivers nearby. That's what they want. That's what we give them, but we don't use it. We will hook up to the grid in an area that has the grid. We'll hook right up to the grid, but we won't use it. Hmm. We'll hook up to the water, your municipal water. We'll even pay the water bill, but we won't use it. Unless, but if we have to, if, if, as a backup, you know, the grid's, to me, the grid's nothing more than a backup these days, and that's that. And but you, but it's the hamburger that they want, so let them have it. I'm not going to fight them on the grid. I'm not going to fight people on the grid. I'm like uh, another uh, Indian chief said, uh, Native American chief said, uh, "I will fight no more forever." That's the way I am. I will fight no more forever. It's not worth fighting. I, I have spent uh, of all the time I've been doing this, I have spent 75 percent of all my time, all my money, and all my energy fighting to do this. And I've spent 25% of my time actually doing it. If that were the other way around, oh my God, we'd have fantastic stuff going on. Right now we got pretty good stuff going on, but we could have it so much better. So I don't fight. I, there's no reason to fight. I play the, the pill and the hamburger game. I love that. I love that. Those are great examples. I think it was Bruce Lee who was talking about being like water. That reminds me of that. We visited this intentional community, and um, I'm not going to say which one because they were secretive about this fact, but uh, they were worried about the county giving them a hard time because they had this series of ponds that would fill, that had plants that would filter out the waste. And it would go from one pond, and then it would go down to the next pond, next pond. And the idea is after you've gone through this series of ponds, the water comes out clean on the other end. Of course, the county wouldn't approve of that, so they did the same hamburger with the pill inside technique they had a septic set up and it just occurred to me there's a creek it's a dry creek but when it rains really heavily we have a 10 acre uh, ranch here in central texas and there's a septic on our guest house and the drain field is really damn close to this creek right and so never really occurred to me and it's funny that they're trying to have this wastewater authority in order to protect the environment but in reality oftentimes what it is that they want is diametrically opposed to what the reality is. And another thing too, when you're dealing with the legislature, one thing that sprung up for me is like all these different industries have their own little cartel. And perhaps one of the most prevalent cartels out in rural areas 
is the septic cartel because you have to have a septic if you're going to have a home, right, or be tapped into the municipal sewage. But out in the country, there's no municipal sewer um, systems. But you got to have that septic. It's extremely expensive. It's probably expensive because everybody has to have it. So I appreciate that methodology because oftentimes when you're resisting, it creates friction. But when you're just like, you know what, I'm going to go with the flow. I'm going to be like water. It makes it easier for you to carry on with your mission. It's kind of an Aikido approach. Yeah, there you go. Yep, for sure. Excellent, excellent. Okay, cool. So you're going to be speaking at the Excellent Build Land Summit. You're one of our keynote speakers. Can you give us a little tease on what it is that you're going to be presenting? Well, uh, I'll be presenting the reality of Earthships for sure. And and like what we've been talking about, what they do, how to, how to go about getting them. And, and mainly where well, we're focused now, we spent 55 years learning to do this. Now I need to spend the next decade or two, if I can stay alive, I need to spend the next decade or two getting this to the people. And what that means is that it, it, you, can't, you can't make this an economical thing to make money. We have to make enough. Our, our business model is keep your nose and mouth above water so you can breathe, but you don't need any more than that. Um, so we're, we're going to make this be something that is as make, we're going to make sustainable autonomous housing as easy to obtain for people as going down to the BMW dealer and plunking down $700 and walking out with a lease and the keys to a BMW. We are going to get into subsidy leasing of airships around the world because they are ready. To, they're ready to drive right now. They're, they're roadworthy. They are the thing. We demonstrate them to people with Airbnb or ships that, that, and that you should read the, the, the reviews that people write about the being in these buildings. They're just, uh, you know, they hit every topic of, of living. And we've learned from that. And now people really rave about them. And it's time for us to, we'll keep evolving them, but it's time for us to evolve a method like Henry Ford's assembly line. Uh, uh, it's time for us to evolve a method to getting these, making these available to people. I used to think, well, we just teach everybody how to build them, but that's not enough. Some people should not build their BMW. Some people need to lease it. And many people, more people need to lease it than need to build it. And so we got to cover every angle and making it easy for people to obtain them is a big project. Right on. Um, I, you know, I want to, I, I feel differently when it comes to profit and having excess capital, because in order to truly scale, oftentimes if profit is a motive, it allows for the cash flow that then allows to reach more people. And then here's one thing too that occurred to me as you were sharing that. One thing that's allowed for the spread of all these traditional houses, of course, is the banks and easy liquidity and low interest rates, right? Not right now, at least, but but it also has led to these gigantic bubbles with this fake economy. But what if, if there was more profit in what it was you're doing, you could take, and there's like a lot of excess capital, then you could become a lender to finance the building of these homes. Because I think that's going to be one of the hurdles, as I'm sure you've already known. None of these traditional banks are going to give a loan to build an earth ship, right? Is, what, is, what do you think when I say, share that? Well, a lot of banks do loan uh, they're, they're, the banks are getting together and, and realizing that they need to not stand in the way of evolution towards sustainable autonomous housing. And they're, they're, you know, they'll, they used to look at earthships as a joke, but now they're seeing that, well, they take care of people, whereas the other buildings are a pile of pickup sticks. After oh, wow. a tornado. And so that's one thing. They are evolving, not fast enough, but they are. But the thing is that people, um, uh, they, the ownership thing also, you know, to the, the barriers between you starting right today and say, I want to build a home, an earthship. You've got to get land. You've got to have it pay a surveyor and a realtor. You've got to get a draw an architect or somebody to draw it. You've got to get uh, 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 engineers to engineer it. Uh, you've got to get permitting officials to give it permits. You, there are so many barriers and bank approval and insurance and realtor surveys, architects, contract. I mean, the fees that you have to pay to get your family in a home are unbelievable, bewildering, and just downright humiliating to have to beg through all of that to get your family in a home. 
And, and that would be, you know, that's too hard for a lot of people. That's just too much. So what we want to do is make it so they can lease them. They don't have to get into all of that. They can just like you lease a BMW. You go down to the Earthship store and hmm. you lease an Earthship. You you pay a thousand dollars down, and and you if you if you qualify, you can get subsidized. I've done subsidized housing. It's amazing. It does work. Um, and you you lease it, and you you lease it, uh, and you get the keys within hours hmm. rather than within years, and a ulcer at the same time or a heart attack. Hmm. So I think we can learn from. Do you know anybody? How many people do you know that do not have a car? But how many people that do you know that do not have an auto, a home? You know, renting is different than leasing. And but leasing a, a, a sustainable home that has no utility bill. You know, a lot of people have hundreds of dollars of utility bills a month. An Earthship has no utility bill. If we can make them fit into the lease program, very much like when you lease a BMW, then we can cause people to just walk down and walk out with the keys to a home, a sustainable autonomous home. Right on, cool. Yeah, I appreciate that. It sounds like you have some big stuff in the works and I appreciate uh, this grand mission and vision to help make these Earthships more accessible to as many people as possible. Cause I can't really tell it's making a difference for the individual and the planet. So kudos to you, Mr. Reynolds. Thank I you. Yeah, I appreciate you taking some time to join us today and looking forward to meeting you in person at the X and the Build Land Summit. Do you want to share how folks can follow your work and, and tap more into the work you're doing with Earthships? Uh, well, it's really Earthship.com and there's there's Earthship uh, Instagrams and and Earthship Facebooks. and uh, But really all through Earthship.com and you'd Google anything Earthship and uh, tons of stuff come up on YouTube, all kinds of videos explanations and things. It's just out there. It's like you can research it just like in, you can research nutrition and you'll get pros and cons, but uh, they, they, just like you do with anything. Uh, but the thing is, this direction has shown me when I was, you know, two winters ago, walking down my hallway barefoot, harvesting tomatoes and bananas and other very wealthy people were waiting in line for food, water and going to their cars for heat. Uh, it showed me that we're on the right track. Excellent. Excellent. All right. Well, you keep up the good work and we'll see you May 18th to the, to the 22nd at the Exxon Build Land Summit. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you sir. And we'll Take see care. you then. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. There you have it, ladies and gents. Michael Reynolds of Earthship.com, pioneer, continuing to pioneer. And something that's cool about Mr. Reynolds is he has some great ideas, but he's managed to put these ideas into practice turning Earthships into a global phenomenon. And now he's aiming to take it even further by creating opportunities for the masses to access this incredible home living technology, not even a house, but a vessel as he calls it. Again, you'll be able to watch Mr. Reynolds. If you want to tap into the live stream, you can get a virtual immersion pass. He'll be speaking on Saturday. He'll be the keynote for our little section during the summit on natural building. We're also going to hear from the folks at Haven Earth PMA, River and Amani. They'll be talking a little bit about hemp as a natural building tool. And we're going to hear from all sorts of folks that are doing really off-grid real estate developments. Uh, we've got some folks talking about how to avoid all these crazy regulations as well. It's a really solid smorgasbord of people that care about the planet, care about independence and autonomy, getting off grid. I hope you'll join us. You can get the virtual immersion pass again to see Mr. Reynolds, or you can sign up for free to watch the first day and a half, or better yet, you join us in person in Bastrop, Texas. You'll be able to tap into the farm and property tours taking place on day one and day five. The formal conference is three days, and it's at the Bastrop Convention Center. You can learn all about it at exitandbuildlandsummit.com exit and build land summit.com tickets are on sale now feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions help desk at libfree.academy help desk at libfree.academy we just announced recently as well you could bring your kiddos um and they don't have to get a ticket unless they're going to partake in the farm to table meals we got a really cool child care setup uh, that's going to teach the kids about art and have all a teen camp and all sorts of stuff so really trying to go above and beyond with the third land summit i hope to see you there Michael Reynolds will be joining us in the flesh. All right, once again, you've been tuned into the Live Free Now show, bringing you the news, views, tips, and tools you can use to live a free, prosperous, and healthy life. Until next time, peace and freedom, my friends.